welcome today to this event at the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies. Um, there's our director, Jonathan Kaplan. Uh, I'm Naomi Lindstrom. I coordinate the series on Jewish life in the Americas. This is an event in this series. And I'm introducing today Golan Moskowitz. His talk is sponsored, of course, by the Schusterman Center, but we also have co-sponsorship from LGBTQ Studies, the Department of English, the Program in Comparative Literature, and the Department of American Studies. So a bit about Golan. He's an assistant professor of Jewish studies at Tulane. He teaches courses on Jewish gender and sexuality, American popular culture, Holocaust studies, and comics and graphic narrative. And he's the author of the book, Wild Visionary, Maurice Sendak in Queer Jewish Context. And he has several publications on intergenerational memory and post-Holocaust family narrative. And currently he is going over to the HRC at every possible opportunity mm -hmm. <laughs> to do some research toward a book project on the participation of Jews in drag performance in America. Mm -hmm. And he has been attracting a lot of attention. A lot of people are getting to know who he is and getting familiar with his work, including me. So I'm extremely pleased to have him here. Today he's speaking on Wild Outside in the Night, Queer Jewishness and Childhood Liminality in the Picture Books of Maurice Sendak. Golan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to either speak quickly or to skip over some sections. I know some people have to leave at one, so no worries if you, if you have to go a bit early. Um, thank you so much, Naomi Lindstrom, for the invitation, for the warm hospitality. It's already been such a rewarding trip. Um, and thank you, all of you, for being here today and to all the co-sponsors of the event. Um, so again, my name is Golan Moskowitz, he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm a cultural historian and literary scholar at Tulane. And um, the basis of my talk, and we'll see if, you know, if I'm happy to share slides later on too, but this last, um, is the basis of this talk is Wild Visionary, Maurice Sendak in Queer Jewish Context, which is a book I published in 2020 with Stanford University Press. Um, I know many of us needed silver linings in 2020, and this really was mine, um, the publication of this. Um, it situates how Sendak's creative output relates to internalized concerns of Jewish American identity, LGBTQ studies, and uh, Holocaust memory, and also the history of modern childhood. Um, and my book does so by mobilizing a historically contextualized account of Sendak's life and work to advance and generate new dimensions of cultural theory. And ultimately, what I try to argue is that Sendak's particular experience of Jewishness, queerness, and their intersections um, directly impacted his creative contributions to literary and affective shifts in children's literature in the mid-20th century and offered new mirrors of resilience, not only for children, but also for other marginal individuals accustomed to misrecognition, creative shape-shifting, and the employment of fantasy for survival. And so in this talk, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate how Sendak's creative sensibilities convey his historically specific position as a queer American child of Yiddish-speaking immigrants who were impacted by the economic depression and by <coughs> Holocaust losses. To do so, I'll offer an overview of Sendak's upbringing following, followed by close readings of Sendak's writing and creative works. And I'll root the analysis in cultural histories of Jewish Brooklyn, of American childhood, Holocaust memory, and queer identity. Or at least I'll give you a taste of, of these threads, which I um, do more fully in my book. I enact more fully. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna discuss how my book employs theory from trauma and memory studies also, um, specifically looking at how impulses towards self-evacuation and creative investment in once removed pasts operate in Sendak's work. Beyond demonstrating the impact of queerness in Jewish culture and history on Sendak's creative vision, I also strive in my book to illustrate how Sendak channeled these marginal sensibilities and emotional rhythms into creative battlegrounds for challenging wider American conceptions of childhood. He referred to his, himself sometimes as a warfare, a guerrilla warfare in his best books. So when Zendak passed away in 2012, he did so as a cultural legend. Uh, I think in one of his New York Times obituaries, the author described Zendak as one of the most powerful figures in, in America because of his ability to give shape to the fantasies of countless children. Why? Okay, so driving his success was his ability to recall, humanize, and formally exalt emotional qualities of childhood, including, and maybe especially, childhood's unpleasant, awkward, and painful aspects. He pierced through rose-colored cliches about, quote-unquote, childhood simplicity, 
Of course, childhood is not a singular concept, but rather childhood varies across contexts. I think we all can agree on this. So what specific kind of childhood most informed his creative vision? Sendak himself was born into a lower middle class Brooklyn family, and his youth spanned the Depression, spanned the depression in World War II um, in this family of Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants, his parents each having immigrated alone as teenagers uh, shortly before World War I. He claimed that he had internalized the fragility of his existence as a sickly Brooklyn infant before the advent of penicillin, whose immigrant parents fretted openly in front of him about the possibility of him dying and then raised him during the Great Depression. Accordingly, his work focused on a single question that obsessed him, how do children survive? In his own words, his art would repeatedly ask, how do you prevent dying? How do you prevent being eaten or mauled by a monster? His caretakers had conveyed historically based anxieties to him at an early age, warning him that Jews were often targeted with violence, that children can sometimes lose their parents and even die unprotected. Families like Sendak's held tight to their children and imbued them with values of resilience and survivalism. They stressed the importance of political consciousness and of in-group loyalty, even as they pushed their children to achieve American success. Sendak's home was an atmosphere of emotionally fraught insecurity and close-knit familial bonds. His mother, Sadie, and maternal grandmother, Minnie, instilled a fearful wariness of non-Jews in the dominant population, recounting pogroms in their old village of Zakrochem, Poland, during which Cossacks ransacked Minnie's grocery store, Minnie pushing Sadie and her siblings into the cellar to hide. And by age four, Sendak would recount having nightmares of this sort of trope. Despite his sensitivity to frightening recollections, he considered one of the highlights of his childhood to be the violent, fantastical stories told to him by his father at bedtime. Likely drawing from Midrashic tales and folklore of his own Cheder community as a child in Zembrowa, Poland, Philip embellished otherwise truthful renderings of his youth with elements of fantasy, of biblical archetypes, and of ghost stories. These were cliffhanger tales that often extended over multiple nights, including the terror of Cossacks and Polish peasants who wielded clubs studded with nails. They featured children who get lost, fall asleep in the snow, or struggle to get their parents to recognize them after a period of separation. I'm going to skip over the examples to save some time here. But um, Philip's stories blended in Sendak's imagination with fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. These also used metaphor, repetition, and hyperbole to offer wild, poignant truths and warnings, even to children. Sendak would later illustrate some of these tales in a collection called In Grandpa's House, which I think is on screen. Um, 1985, it was eventually published based on translations of the Yiddish stories his father had told him. The Sendaks were not alone in narrating dark or upsetting situations to their children. Reflecting generations of oral storytelling in Jewish Poland, bedtime stories in many Yiddish-speaking immigrant families like Sendaks reflected the need to nourish the child's capacity to locate and heed dangerous situations. This, also reflect, this is also reflected in Yiddish children's literature more broadly in the interwar years in Europe and the US, which handled difficult themes of war, violence, racism, lynching, mortality more broadly. Yiddish children's literature in the 30s, like Philip's bedtime stories, reflected the harsh realities that endangered minorities faced, as well as the political terror of living under an oppressive regime. If Sadie and Philip burdened their children or exposed them to harsh realities, Sendak actually understood their emotional transparency as more respectful of their children's capacities than a stance of concealment or condescension would have been. What might have struck outsiders as an immigrant parent's lack of social refinement by public standards in the way they raised their children was thus for Sendak a means of trust building and emotional connection against the restraint and mannered calculation of mainstream parenting ideals of the time. As Sendak once mused, my parents were immigrants and they didn't know that they should clean their stories up for us. So we heard horrible, horrible stories and we loved them. We absolutely loved them. Sendak repeating the details of these stories would, have hi would be sent home to have um, his mouth washed out with soap. Right? His teachers didn't really like this. While parent-child relations in families like Sendak's might have challenged middle-class social laws of propriety, they also elicited strong emotional bonds and inspired wild fantasies in the service of humor and truth-seeking within an othered family unit. And this is uh, important in his work, which um, I, I detailed more fully in my book and I'll gesture at a bit later. 
Beyond Sendak's immediate family, the artist's more distant, quote unquote, greenhorn relatives uh, were some of the most frightening and inspiring to him. He would famously recall a typical Sunday afternoon in the late 30s in which his Polish refugee relatives would come over and devour much of Sadie's food. As a child whose cheeks they pinched, Sendak almost feared that they'd eat him as well. And this, this might be familiar to some of you. <laughs> These relatives he repeatedly claimed would later serve as the primary inspiration for the wild things who would later entreat Max with their haunting plea, oh, please don't go, we'll eat you up, we love you so. Like the wild things, Sendak recalled his relatives as, quote, a huge bunch who would roughly snatch you up at any moment. They'd jabber loudly in a foreign tongue kiss, pinch, maul, and hug you breathless, all in the name of love. Their dread faces loomed, flushed, jagged teeth flaring, eyes inflamed, and great nose hairs cascading, all oddly smelly and breathy, all dangerous, all growling. But I also add all relatives, right? There's a kind of human quality. You can see at least one of the wild things has human feet. Um, and uh, there's, there's kind of a, a warmth that Max generates living among the wild things. If Sendak's relatives um, seemed to him somewhat wild or even dangerous, he also venerated them. The artist consistently applauded his family's emotional style for offering a frank dynamic of informality and affectionate solidarity between parents and children, between elders and youth. Despite American individualist ideals that discourage deep emotional intertwinement across generation. This cultural difference is recorded in simple and profound terms also by another writer, Eva Hoffman, who may be familiar to some of you. Um, she immigrated from Poland to North America after her parents survived the Holocaust in hiding. And as Hoffman would write after arriving in North America, familial bonds seem so dangerously loose here. Against a backdrop of assimilation pressures that derided Yiddish speakers and encouraged immigrants' children to assert themselves as distinctively American individuals, Sendak internalized a culturally fraught separation anxiety with his immigration or with his immigrant parents. And these would color his depictions of children who must fend for themselves beyond their parents' protection, as well as depictions of grown-ups who become hovering moons or wild creatures that both endear and repel the child protagonist. Right, this push and pull. Maybe I should start doing this so everyone can see. Beyond matters of American acculturation, the close-knit Sendak family unit experienced even greater distress as news of real-life horror stories penetrated their Brooklyn home in the 40s, the 1940s. Jewish relatives were being deported and murdered overseas. Right? Both, pa both parents were from Poland. Sadie and Philip continuously received word of Jewish deaths in Europe by way of American Jewish social agencies and Philip's social club. Sadie would yell and pull at her hair. Philip would collapse and disappear, including the morning of Sendak's own bar mitzvah in June 1941. In their apartment, they displayed photographs of nieces and nephews sent to concentration camps, including newlyweds and infants. These images were all that Sendak knew of most of his, most of his extended family. And I quote him, it was suffocating, unhappy, almost like my father was blaming me for being alive. Dead Jews, the photographs, hung all over the place, end quote. Sadie and Philip constantly contrasted their youngest son's irreverent childhood energies with those idealized young relatives in Poland whom they mourned. If Sendak complained or misbehaved, his parents were quick to call him a wildechai, or wild beast, or wild thing in Yiddish, shaming him for taking his privileges for granted, privileges that were denied cousins overseas who starved in concentration camps or burned in ovens. And I quote him again, if I was staying out late and dinner was on the table and I'd been called three times, my mother's voice would tell me that I'd better go up now. And she'd say, your cousins, they're in a concentration camp. You have the privilege of being here and you don't come up and eat. They have no food. I was made to feel guilty all the time that I was shamelessly enjoying myself when they were being cooked in an oven. Sendak despised these reminders of his own vulnerability as a Jew, even in America. Clearly, his family's proximity to migration and to collective trauma colored the tone of their household and separated them from most other American homes. But again, this household was not unusual among Yiddish-speaking Jews in the impulse to expose children to historical horrors, even those as stark as genocide at times. Contrary to narratives that assert a universal silence about the events of the Holocaust in the immediate aftermath, uh, we do see in Yiddish schools and periodicals that there is discussion of these events almost immediately, beginning with Kristallnacht in November 1938. 
Children's journals like the Kinderjournal in Yiddish detailed accounts of ghettos, gassing, and other atrocities committed against Jews in Poland. And Yiddish writers even sometimes made emotional pleas directly to Jewish children. A 1942 issue of the Kinderjournal, for example, features a, fr a front page story about hundreds of homeless Jewish refugee children in America rescued from the war by the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and the United Palestine Appeal. The article describes the invasion of Jews' homes by stormtroopers at night and masses of Jews forced into starvation and death in concentration camps. And one photograph depicts a group of refugee children explaining they cannot muster a smile because their hearts are weighted with grief. The systematic murder of Jewish relatives in Europe during World War II surely complicated American Jews' expectations of their own children as well. And in the Sendax Bensonhurst neighborhood, we see examples of this in the Orthodox congregation Sons of Israel, for example. Uh, their 1947 yearbook celebrated the sight of young children uh, of seven or eight studying Chumash and recalled that the cherubim were said to resemble children, symbolizing the role of youth in transmitting Jewish tradition to future generations, um, really emphasizing the role of the Jewish child for the rebirth and destiny of post-war American Jewry. Often, however, post-war American children also reminded their parents of those relatives and friends who did not live to know them and could never be sufficiently replaced. Comparisons and associations made between Jewish children and lost relatives were understandably burdensome for those children. Some parents paradoxically demanded <clears throat> that their post-war offspring both preserve the family's painful history while also becoming exceptionally successful, happy, and carefree to compensate for losses and to spite Hitler. Speaking for himself and his siblings, Sendak would later lament, we did not know who we were and whatever we chose to be was seemingly in opposition to what our parents wanted us to be. Although their household did not experience Nazi terror directly, they may be said to have undergone a kind of secondhand trauma as they learned in real time about their family's decimation abroad and struggled to make sense of the implications and of their own powerlessness. And it's through this once removed or indirect positionality that I, I theorize Sendak's creative vision more fully. So I'm going to expose you to a little bit of the theorizing I do around trauma in this work. So literary theorist Kathy Carruth has described trauma as an unclaimed experience, an internalization that is too painful or chaotic for consciousness to fully claim or to sufficiently process as a lived experience, yet also at the same time too eventful and too penetrating to be discarded altogether. Right, it exists in this sort of liminal limbo space. Trauma theory understands this sort of unclaimed experience to produce internal disorganization and a related sense of timelessness that may compel repetitive acts of searching, data collection, emotional externalizations, and an attempt to master or resolve those internal conflicts. In the, in the case of Sendak, whose work invested intensely in the memory of relatives murdered in the Holocaust, <coughs> excuse me, just lost my place here, um, the news of their deaths during his adolescence represented a complicated and overwhelming matrix of violent meanings. The deaths of these relatives signified a lost connection to spaces of ethnic and cultural belonging. They, they also represented the resulting incapacitation of his own caretakers on, who he, on whom he depended for survival, and an internalized belief that people like him were not safe in the world. His father, Philip, had assured him the Holocaust could happen in America and that he should keep a suitcase packed in the closet just in case. And I also want to stress as a queer outsider, he struggled to make friends and fixated on the various forms of endangerment he internalized. And these compounding forms of queer and uh, Holocaust conscious um, Jewish displacement, these compounding forms of displacement or alienation inform a later claim that he would make at the top of the screen here, um, I skipped my adolescence, total amnesia. The perceived displacement of his adolescence, the skipping of his adolescence, situates him within the realm of Carruth's theory of unclaimed experience. Similarly, within memory studies, you probably can't read this text, but right, Mariana Hirsch's work, um, the, the theory of post-memory refers to what it means to grow up intertwined with a parent's overwhelmingly meaningful, but also inaccessible experiences of endangerment and loss. The parent's unresolved and all-pervasive psychology as it manifests in behavior and relational style leads post-memorial children to feel haunted or threatened by a past that they did not themselves directly experience, as well as compelled to piece that past together somehow and to relate, it, relate to it um, through creative investment in, that, in the parent's traumatic history. 
My study also demonstrates the interrelatedness of post-memory with Agnieszka Bedingfield's concept of trans-memory. And this might be of interest to people who do um, translation studies um, and, and who study immigrants in general. Um, this is another kind of figurative recall. Trans-memory focuses not necessarily on trauma, but on the difficulty of cultural and linguistic adjustment from the language and memory of immigrant parents and their origins to the language and culture of a new adopted home country. I mentioned Sendak's household was a Yiddish-speaking household. His parents never fully really mastered English, especially his mother. His father eventually learned a little bit, but Sendak was a kind of go-between um, between his family and the, the, the wider world when it came to English, as were his siblings. According to Bedingfield, the subject's stability may be threatened by the inability to narrate the past in a, in a, a language meaningful to the present. Right? What does it mean to internalize a language and a culture of one's parents that is not easily translated right, into the, the present and into the future um, in America? This characterized Sendak's experience in a Yiddish-speaking household and a wider culture pressuring assimilation and decades before the emergence of mainstream Holocaust memory in Anglophone culture. Right? So Holocaust memory itself was a kind of internal in-group, um, often Yiddish sort of um, experience before mainstream Holocaust memory emerges, um, more so in the 60s, 70s, later on, uh, really not even more so until the 90s. As Bedingfield writes of trans memory, um, subjects who, who experience trans memory have an impulse to return to the imagined origins of an uneasy heritage that overshadows them and somewhat defines them in order to find closure with unresolved internal conflicts in the present. And we see in Sendak's work the giving shape to such past-oriented familial longings. Um, in, in a lot of his works, there's a return to the world of the old, wor the old world, right? a Poland of what was lost as he imagines it through his parents, and to the frustrations and impotence such longings sometimes induced by virtue of their secondhand nature. So let's get to the queer part here. So while Hirsch and Bedingfield illuminate how a parent's history might displace a child's own narrative, Queer theory understands the capacity of wider dominant cultural ideas to occupy and suppress a child's experience. The queer child, for example, is displaced by the overarching norms and expectations of a prevailing social structure that condemns the child's emerging identity or desires as impossible or as unwelcome. Right? How often, especially in the 20th century, are children able to say, I am a queer child or I am a trans child, I am a gay child etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? It's usually in ghostly retrospect in adulthood. One claims one's queer youth, one claims one's queer childhood. Another kind of evacuation, another kind of displacement, right? Um, so Catherine Bond Stockton paints queer childhood as, as a, ki a kind of ghostly self-evacuation under the prohibition of claiming one's own stigmatized internal reality, at least until adulthood. Sendak fought to embody and assert his own feelings and sense of self against an overwhelming set of adult-imposed obstacles. And key to my argument, I think, is, is the kind of invisibility and displacement we have on both sides of the Jewish and queer equation for him, right? Be, his aloneness in his queerness within the Jewish community, his aloneness in his Jewishness within, uh, or vice versa, right? I kind of got tongue-tied there, right? But the queerness and the Jewishness um, don't necessarily merge for him in his experience here. Um, and then the Americanness we throw uh, in addition, that which further complicates. Okay, so um, in his own words, am I on the right slide? Yep. Um, in his own words, Sendak felt like the changeling ice baby that he would depict an outside over there in 1981, who switched and replaced by some false version of himself to which his mother has no awareness. He would base outside over there on what he called the hell of growing up without knowing who to talk to, who to trust, or how to function. Sendak described his own childhood exclusion in the wider culture from dominant channels of meaning making and his consequent difficulty coming into his own feelings and actualizing as a coherent subject. To understand how such individuals, like Sendak, the way he describes his youth, um, cope and survive, right? That question, how do children survive? And children like Sendak, uh, in what he was experiencing in particular, um, to understand how such individuals cope and survive, Stockton offers a theory called growing sideways, a proposition that queer or displaced subjects who cannot authentically grow upward or forward um, by conventional standards instead grow outward, projecting themselves into uncharted, sometimes hidden spaces of culture that society perceives as incoherent, wild, or sometimes as avant-garde. A central thread in my book analyzes the queerness of Sendak's displacement as he depicted it and its intertwinement with the lost worlds of his parents' Poland and the vicarious Holocaust terror his family experienced from a distance um, in, as, as the relatives in Europe were being killed. 
And I unpacked Sendak's repeat, repeated motif in this sense of the child who becomes airborne, adrift, right, literally displaced, implicated in worlds beyond their comprehension, worlds that are both inscrutable, that are hard to understand, but also crucial to their interiority, that require some amount of um, fantasy and meaning making from the margin. Though figures like um, Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, and Charles Schultz, uh, the Peanuts strip, right, um, had already by the 50s and late 40s, actually, before Sendak started to complicate perceptions of childhood, Sendak did so in a different way. Less so uh, is he absurdist or satirical or existential. Um, instead, he's using really um, romanticist and psychoanalytic approaches to complicating childhood. But similarly to Geisel and Schultz before him, he is challenging this figure called the generic child, according to historian Nicholas Salmon, this figure that emerged in America's cultural imagination between about 1900 and 1960. Um, what is the generic child? You might be able to guess. As a cultural symbol, the generic child represented ideals that parents pursued as they raised their children, right? So based on social norms, uh, the image mobilized by marketers of childhood products to inspire sales of those products. Youth markets are growing in the early, early and mid 20th century. And also um, the representational embodiment of vulnerable innocence cited by critics who condemned elements of American public and commercial culture in the name of protecting the children. Um, right, so when family values become um, sort of a hostile political tactic. The child symbol was, con this child symbol was conceived as obedient, physically restrained, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, um, a child with uncomplicated emotions, epitomized by the Dick and Jane readers published between 1930 and 1965. And populations seeking entry into the middle class were often eager to obey the prescriptions of this child, of the generic child, uh, which operated as a cultural site of debate uh, for the, about those who warranted inclusion in the nation's future and under what conditions. Children's literature about ethnic minorities in the immediate post-war years helped to integrate the image of conditionally white ethnic families, including most Jewish, Irish, and Italian immigrants, um, using an image of quote-unquote normal, lighthearted, decorous, and thoroughly American white ethnic children. Uh, and we see, we see echoes of this, or kind of reverberations of this, even in Yiddish per periodicals. So Jewish ch children's periodicals reflect American Jews' emotional shift towards suburban, middle-class belonging and optimism at mid-century. Um, the Kinder Journal revamped its cover art by the late 1940s with a more childish aesthetic. In April 1946, the periodical shifted from its previous cover art, um, which had featured ornamental patterns and majestic animals, instead to feature wide-eyed cartoonish children uh, accompanied by dolls, baseball bats, and playful cartoon animals. I'm going to skip over a bit to save some time here. Um, Sidney Taylor's children's book, All of a Kind Family, in 1951, offered optimism about um, the potential for minorities like Jewish Americans to integrate into this, this larger generic cultural symbol of childhood, um, even becoming the first children's book series, All of a Kind Family, about Jews to attract a large Gentile readership. Okay, so she's showing the possibility of this crossover. During this cultural moment, a majority of American Jews were securing their middle class belonging, in part through the generic child. More generally, children's literature, um, which was previously marginal in American publishing, it really has its, its major growth in the 40s and 50s, exploded in these post-war post years um, as a profitable beacon of middle class American idealism. With the post-war baby boom and its accompanied rise in funding for public schools and libraries creating a thriving market that prompted publishers to expand their lists. Children's editors, librarians, and critics rose to influence. However, despite these advances, children's literature in the 50s was still relatively obscure and marginalized in the broader fields of publishing and visual art. And this fact perhaps counterintuitively attracted socially insecure artists like Sendak to the field of children's publishing. Because these artists could create their most genuine, heartfelt work off the map, so to speak, unseen, relatively speaking, um, by cultural authorities. In a 2004 interview, Sendak would speak to this reality, um, describing his career in the following words, I did not have much confidence in myself, never, and so I hid inside this modest form called the children's book and expressed myself entirely. And here's that quote, I'm like a guerrilla warfarer in my best books. So he saw himself as kind of hiding in the field of children's literature and expressing passionate, larger than life ideas that were kind of going unnoticed by larger cultural authorities of the time, at least for a while. 
Wild Things kind of, kind of starts to change that by the early 60s. Eschewing the generic child of normative American suburbia, Sendak's depictions drew directly from the emotional underbelly of Jewish Brooklyn, as well as from his own experience of secondhand memory of Polish Jewish life and the impacts of Holocaust losses. His work championed a more complex vision of children's capacities and claimed ground for marginal American subjects. Unlike Dick and Jane or Sidney Taylor's characters, whose emotional styles and behaviors basically blended with ideals of the Gentile middle class, Sendak's ethnically distinct children did not always behave innocently or remain within the confines of a protected domestic sphere in the suburbs. Like immigrants or other minority subjects, they grappled with deep-seated, often invisible dilemmas and emotional crises. They navigated cultural gaps between home and the public sphere, and also between personal orientations and the social pressures of post-war America. Throughout his career, Sendak would invite both controversy and admiration for his radical departure from the generic child ideal, challenging American children's book conventions of depicting normative children in subdued, rose-colored worlds. His rebellious, ethnic-looking children were among the first in children's literature to exhibit rage and emotional excess, as well as to demand love. His Harper editor would say that Where the Wild Things Are was, quote, the first picture book to recognize the fact that children have powerful emotions, anger and love and hate, and only after all that passion, the wanting to be where someone loved them best of all, as we have Max conclude uh, after the rumpus. Of course, Sendak's coming of age was uh, dually marginal due to his family background and his emergent queerness. And as a child, he suffered the nickname Sissy and was more concerned with storytelling and drama than with peers or athletics. He recalled a crush on the man who tutored him for his bar mitzvah, another Polish Jewish immigrant, um, and became fully aware of his sexuality by his teenage years. Coming out as a gay man during the mid 20th century when this was far more taboo, he remained open about his sexual orientation with friends and loved ones and colleagues throughout most of his adulthood, sharing his life with another Jewish American man, Eugene Glynn, who was a psychiatrist and art critic and his romantic partner for um, half a century. Um, so as Jonathan Weinberg, who is the curator at the Sendak Foundation, likes to say, Sendak was not um, necessarily uh, in the closet, he, but he suffered the effects of the closet. Right? The public did not want to know. Um, he, did, he doesn't come out to a, a mainstream press venue until 2008 after his partner Eugene passes away the year after, uh, but he's, he's very much out to his friends, his loved ones, his colleagues that, he, that are in his orbit in his life. Uh, around 1948, several years before meeting Eugene Glynn, his partner, Sendak had begun his own psychoanalysis, so not with psychoan psycho um, psychoanalyst Eugene Glynn, but with another one, Dr. Bertram Slack, also gay and Jewish, and his treatment followed a period in which he had attempted independently to live in Hell's Kitchen at age 20 um, as a young gay man. This was a period that ended in emotional strife and the, the choice to move back into his parents' home in Brooklyn. Sendak might have been attracted to this psychoanalyst's clinical focus on a, the emotional plight of gifted youth whose creative interiority isolated them from the wider society. And it's in sessions with Slaff, Dr. Slaff, that he first comes up with the images that blossom into where the wild things are, of some animal or creature or person, some small creature trapped in an enclosure that needs to break free. It becomes where the wild horses are, about a, a young boy who's chasing wild horses, and then eventually he decides to change horses to things, right, uh, based on his relatives in part. Uh, but this is kind of where a lot of his um, emergence as an artist begins. It was during this time of exploring his own childhood and analysis that he also begins to notice the behavior of Jewish and Sicilian children playing on his parents' block in Brooklyn and starts to keep a sketchbook to re record their quirky antics. These sketches become the models of his early picture book several years later, um, and these children appealed to his creativity as a socially uninitiated, sensitive human being um, these children resided before, outside, or even despite dominant social meanings. Right, they're kind of um, ethnic outsiders living in Brooklyn, um, lower middle class uh, or working class families. For Sendak, who claimed to have missed his adolescence, childhood fantasy play models stra strategic pathways for surviving a life that was not fully his own. Children he knew are regularly asked to surrender themselves to powerful others' emotional needs in order to secure the care that's required for survival. They disappear emotionally while remaining present in the performances expected of them at times. And they're experts, children, at emptying their consciousness to become whatever role they enact. And so Sendak, um, it, it, I, I use Picasso's quote in my book, uh, 
right? We all, something along the lines of we're all born as artists. All, every child is an artist. It's only um, some who, who seek to actively cultivate that part of yourself into your adulthood, which is very much what Sendak strove to do, to speak, to have the child that he was speak within the adult that he became and remain alive within the adult he became. Children also, Sendak noticed, exhibit the powers of comic book heroes. And I should mention his first after-school job um, in high school was working for the comics industry, for All-American Comics, doing uh, background details for Mutt and Jeff and other strips. Children like comic book heroes were able to kind of straddle between different worlds, to move between um, different identities as they figured out who they were in the world, and operated between parents' expectations, the wider societies and peers' expectations in a very dynamic and fluid way. So they, they led the way for his artistic project. And I'm going to jump ahead to um, when Sendak really becomes a star at Harper, um, Harper Books. When he first encountered Ursula Nordstrom, um, the editor of children's books at Harper, who would champion his early career, the 22-year-old was so withdrawn that Nordstrom felt compelled to ask, how old are you? Um, still, the following day, after studying his sketchbook, she hired him to illustrate Marcel Aimé's The Wonderful Farm in 1951, and from there his career took off. He moves back to Manhattan full-time, um, and he starts to draw um, from the sketches of the Jewish and Sicilian children that were in his 1948 sketchbook, uh, especially Rosie, this one child who you might know, the sign on Rosie's door. Um, Rosie inspired a lot of the, his child creations, and she was from a Sicilian family in his neighborhood. A Hole is to Dig by Ruth Krauss is one example here of an early work, um, 1952, featuring unruly, ethnically marginal urban kids who defy normative Anglo ideals of the generic childhood innocence, sweetness, and obedience and restraint. Visually, he's basing, again, these children on the same children from his sketchbook from Brooklyn. And um, he's he, commenting on these Brooklyn children. He once shared, they're all a kind of caricature of me. Quote, they look as if they've been hit on the head and hit so hard they weren't ever going to grow up anymore, end quote. He described them as, quote, old before their time. Most of them were Jewish, like little greenhorns off the boat. They had a kind of bowed look, as if the burdens of the world were on their shoulders. And he's known for drawing children with very large feet and large heads, kind of slumped over. Sendak had not meant for the children of these early books to look like nervous elderly people as commentators viewed them at the time. He simply drew kids the way Brooklyn peers had looked to him, much unlike the depictions of previously existing picture books featuring uncomplicated generic children from what he called other neighborhoods and planets. His early depictions of Brooklyn children also avoid traditional gender norms. Uh, instead, he celebrated uninhibited expressivity, which included girlhood ambition, boyhood sensitivity, and moments of same-sex affection, which were previously absent in American children's books. And you can see some examples on screen here. Um, I know it's already almost one, so I'm going to skip ahead a little further. Um, but just as a quick mention, he did some collaborations with his brother Jack um, in the 50s, uh, Jack Sendak, who um, sometimes wrote stories that Sendak would illustrate. And in these stories in particular, we see early examples of Sendak's drawing from the cultural rhythms of his parents' stories, bringing in motifs of the shtetl, of towns in Poland, um, and also motifs from Yiddish literature. So uh, for those more familiar, there's a famous story, Yingle Tingle Chlat, about a little boy who um, is able, with the help of a uh, Christian nobleman riding a horse, to eventually change the weather. Um, it's, it's, I think it's um, the, the town needs snow for um, their, their society to function properly. Right? In, in the story Happy Rain by Sendak, we have a community who needs the sun to go away and for the rain to come back for, for their society to function. And um, it's interesting, both in that it's drawing from Yiddish literature motifs, but also in that it is um, this strange desire for rain, right, for a kind of gloomy environment. And to me, I sort of interpret this uh, in my own reading as, as potentially a metaphor for the way that Jewish Brooklyn in the 30s and 40s was um, dealing with what was happening to relatives abroad and um, managing a kind of dual expectation of what it meant to be American in those years, right, especially in the post-war years of, of future-oriented optimism, uh, and to also mourn relatives lost and to process the Holocaust as its knowledge was emerging. <coughs> Zlata uh, the goat is another uh, important example here. Uh, which I'm, uh, Did I skip over that one? Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. Zlata the goat from 1962, Yiddish-American writer Isaac Bashevis Singer's story collection. 
Uh, upon the book's publication, the artist cried with his parents, um, identifying images he had drawn from photographs of relatives who were killed in the Holocaust on both sides, um, reviving them in a realistic style for his parents. Uh, and we see kind of a careful, intricate cross-hatching approach where he varies his, his aesthetic um, in different works. And this is uh, the kind of loving execution that we see in this fine pen work, I think, gives um, a kind of fuzzy softness to light and space, humming like a dreamscape and dissolving at its seams, right? Kind of the, the, um, the fragility of lost worlds and of memory. Zlata delivered Yiddish folklore to American mainstream readers and Sendaf saw it as a Jewish collection of stories that would appeal to everyone. In this project, he both exercised personal demons of his while also um, creating a living memorial to his loved ones and their lost worlds for his parents. Um, I want to say just a couple words at least about Night Kitchen. I know that's uh, some people that's a favorite and also I think speaks to um, Sendak's queerness. Um, but this is several years later, 69, 1969 to 1970, that he's finishing up in the Night Kitchen in his Greenwich Village apartment, just a couple blocks away from the Soma rides as they're happening. Meanwhile, his, his mother has already died. His father is dying in his, in his home. He's moved in and is living with him and dictating those Yiddish stories that are later transcribed and translated um, that Sendak illustrates. So this, this moment, I think, really illustrates ways in which Sendak is, straddled, is straddling different realities as a person, right? It's, um, it's the emergence of the gay liberation movement in a more kind of formalized um, uh, way by, by Stonewall. Um, and also we have the um, dealing with the, pa the passing of his father and of his mother who's already passed, right? So he describes this book as a goodbye to childhood and a goodbye to New York. And also um, there's something that uh, is undeniably very sensual about this book as well, right? About a boy who falls out of his clothes at night when his parents are sleeping into um, a vat of dough um, and is almost cooked into an oven by these bakers. Um, the book's depiction of a frontally nude boy wading through milk has led uh, some librarians to censor and ban Night Kitchen since its initial release, a fact that angered him to no end and uh, mobilized his editor at Harper, Ursula Nordstrom, to defend the work uh, as well, gathering hundreds and hundreds of signatures to protest when this book was banned and when it was um, censored with librarians often drawing a diaper over um, <laughs> Mickey's nud frontal nudity. I'm um, happy to talk more about that if anyone wants to stay um, later. But um, during the last decades of the 20th century, we also have Sendak working uh, continually to confront traumas that plagued his family during his adolescence. And a strange synergy exists for him between the perception that he has of those Jewish children whose lives had been forcibly cut short in the Holocaust um, and marginalized queer and emotionally displaced subjects like himself in the present who wished to grow up but found it difficult in a society that misunderstood, endangered, or ignored them. In Sendak's designs for the Nutcracker and accompanying um, picture book as well um, in the 80s for the Nutcracker, he presents Clara as a lonely creative child whose dreams of the future are weighted by grim realities. And you can see references to, um, to Auschwitz right, with um, boys at the top of this ship um, that Clara is setting sail upon um, in structures resembling guard towers wearing shirts with vertical stripes and white and faded blue fabric like camp prisoners. Um, even more explicitly in Dear Millie, which is a, a belatedly discovered Brothers Grimm story that Sendak illustrates, the artist envisions a Holocaust story featuring Anne Frank and a scene of children marched to Auschwitz. He draws this group of children crossing a shaky bridge with a guard tower behind them. And he also, uh, as I mentioned, depicts Anne Frank with a group of children from the French town of Isieux who were mur murdered by Klaus Barbie at the end of World War II. We'll skip ahead for a moment. Brundabar. Um, Sendak later collaborated with Tony Kushner uh, on staging Brundabar, which was based on the 1939 opera by the same name uh, by Hans Krasse and performed over 50 times by children imprisoned in the Theresienstadt um, camp. And the artist also worked with Kushner on a picture book version of the opera in 2003, borrowing the original 1943 watercolor of the stage design used in the camp. And like the original um, set design, Sendak's crayon and watercolor renditions are rich in reds and yellows, as you can see, and reimagine the, the opera's landscape with similar textures of brick and rickety wooden planks. Um, and we see against the visual subtext of poverty, disease, and cruel competition, these children transforming into grizzly bears to fight bullies, as well as conferring with talking cats and sparrows, growing sideways, so to speak, to use Stockton's theory, um, into wild animal realms banding tightly together also in order to survive a dangerous reality. 
and they also represent a variety of physiognomies. Some of them are branded even with um, yellow stars. The main characters are not presented as Jews, and in fact, we see um, a cross hanging in, a crucifix hanging in their, their home at the end of the story, but um, this is very much in dialogue with what's happening um, to this population of Jews in their midst who um, band together to help them fight this bully, Brundabar. Um, okay, I'm just trying to decide how much to skip here. I know we're over time already. So reflecting the historical reality that most um, children who performed Brundabar, the opera in Theresienstadt, were deported to their deaths in the Nazi machinery of annihilation, Sendak ends the book with a warning about the perennial nature of hatred, having the bully, Brundabar, proclaim that even seemingly defeated villains tend to return in one way or another. And in another scene, this image of darkened uh, this darkened scene of weeping mothers who appear beneath giant blackbirds who carry their children away into the night sky, right, reflecting the family separation um, and uh, the deaths of many children. While working on Brindabar, and this will end on a, a bit of a more playful note, um, Sendak also joined Glenn Dixon's Syrian Klezmer Orchestra on a project called Pincus and the Pig, a Klezmer version of Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. While writing the script, uh, he changed Peter into Pincus, which was his, uh, his father's Yiddish name, and the wolf was changed to Chazer, which um, is pig in Yiddish, an epithet that Sendak's aunt had used to refer to uh, people who were anti-Semitic in Poland. Um, and so the artist even offered his own voice for the recorded narration, infusing the language and tone with the embodied cadences of his late relatives, of his original wild things. And if this works, I'll play you um, a short clip of him. Sorry if it's very loud. Uh, you'll get to hear some of his kind of Yiddish inflected banter reflecting the, um, the spirits of his uh, relatives, his wild things. On the branch of a big old tree, a little boy sat quetching away. Oi, vey, oi, God in Himmel, the gate is open. Is Pinkus looking to get killed again? Surely Chaza, that devil pig. And his gang of schmutzige vile schwein will patch poor Pinkus <laughs> into chopped liver. So what I like about this clip is, first of all, you get a little bit of Sendak brought to life for you, but also um, that it, it, it reveals also that um, something important to remember about Sendak is that there's a lot of doom and gloom that surrounds his work, but there's also a lot of joy in play, right? And um, that that there's um, the other side of the equation for him, right? He had this amazing sense of humor. Uh, he saw uh, childhood as a time not just of suffering and survival, but also of creativity, of imagination. Um, so emotionally drained by Brunjabar at the time, he appreciated this opportunity to work more playfully on a project about his roots that ends in a child's triumph. Uh, Chazer, the evil predator, is ultimately caught and sent to the unkosher butcher. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now in just a minute or two. Um, in this talk, I've argued that Sendak's work, I've started to show you at least the arguments I make about how Sendak's work transformed and universalized a marginalized embodied experience that was balanced between, on the one hand, queer difference in Jewish culture and memory, including the gaps and overlaps between Jewish and queer culture and memory, um, and on the other hand, broader expectations of generic acculturation and normative social trajectories that targeted the symbolic space of childhood. Sensitive to outer threats from infancy and emotionally displaced in his, ado in his adolescence uh, by the despair of wartime losses during an era of widespread acculturation, Sendak found himself identifying with young children and with their capacity for tightroping across disparate worlds as socially uninitiated creative sufferers. As he struggled to actualize his adult life and career in the 40s and 50s, the marginal space of children's literature appeared to him uh, as a place to hide, to express his creativity uh, from the margins until he, until he gained a great deal of fame, that is. Uh, he sought to resolve his own internal conflicts by exploring how children manage to comprehend and survive exclusion and danger. In his work, peculiar and sensitive children balance across limbo realms situated between ethnically othered family members, inaccessible but also inescapable forms of memory, and a society that seeks to impose demands of assimilation on minority subjects without always meeting them where they are. He found his artistic voice in the service of expanding the culture's conception of childhood, building creatively on existing critiques of mid-century America's socially conformist and exclusionary culture, and thereby continue contributing to a, a dignified mirror to those people especially marginalized by that culture and its values. Inspired by a psychological exploration of his own emotional world as a young person, he challenged the notion that children comprise a singular generic category of raw matter for adult shaping, 
a notion that was fueled by exclusionary cultural incentives in the first place. Sendak's work insisted that regardless of their age, children are in fact diverse human agents embodying transnational histories and complex orientations, and that children comprise the seeds of a vibrant, evolving future beyond the limits of established conventions. Through his depictions of wild, irreverent, flamboyant, or culturally unusual children, Sendak uh, pointed to counterintuitive social virtues that may accompany seemingly negative or strange bodies and affects, suggesting that the social other can make for an ideal teacher on matters of resilience, survival strategies, and the importance of metaphor and fantasy for preserving sensitive internal meanings. In this regard, my book project on Sendak is also a study of how a social category like childhood can function or operate as a cultural site through which broader realities of memory and political dynamics and lived embodiments are negotiated in the present. And so um, I apologize for going over, but thank you so much for bearing with me and for listening to this kind of, um, thank you. Well, first, thank you, Golan, for persevering and giving such a great talk, despite uh, your images being short to practically nothing. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure you'll entertain questions. For sure, yeah. So we'll have some questions, and I'll ask people to use their microphones so they'll be recorded. Did Sundak have a presence in the New Yorker? The um, Sundak did. He had a, um, a cover, actually. So the two examples come to mind right away. He had a cover in the early 90s when he was writing, um, I think I have a slide of it actually, We're All in the Dumps with Jack and Guy. Um, this came out in 1993. And it was two nursery rhymes that um, he kind of brought and cobbled together and um, animated them with his images. Uh, but this, this is a, a work that in some ways is critiquing um, uh, capitalism. Uh, there's the, the villains are these sort of capital, these evil capitalist rats who are um, gambling with cards and as these children and kind of ambiguously aged figures are uh, homeless and living out in these houses built without walls right, and are wearing um, newspapers as clothing. But in the newspapers, we see headlines about um, what's also happening, uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, right, so the word AIDS is, is written a few times in, in um, all caps and uh, other sorts of political strife of the time. And he's also memorializing friends who, um, who died in the AIDS crisis. So um, Jim Marshall, the picture book, the children's picture book artist who did um, George and Martha, was a friend of his that died uh, about a year before. And so he memorializes Jim as well. Um, he has one of the angels reading his books and says, in, in a newspaper strip that a child is wearing, Jim goes home with the date of his death. Um, but uh, to that, that gets away from your question, which he, he had a cover of The New Yorker that he did himself, uh, which comes straight out of the characters of this book. It's a scene um, of, of these homeless children uh, on the cover of, of um, The New Yorker, and there's this sort of worried moon that looks over th uh, the scene, and the moon he based on his mother, Sadie, who he remembered her head darting out of, of the window to look at, make sure her children were still alive, playing on this dangerous Brooklyn block with, you know, cars. Um, once a, a, a car did hit a child in front of Sendak, and that kind of uh, lasted, that memory lasted in terms of his, his fear of surviving as a child. Um, so this moon, this hovering moon, is this kind of anxious uh, immigrant Jewish mother who's watching to make sure her head darts out from every window to make sure her children are safe. And ultimately, the moon saves the children in this story. Um, and so he's kind of bridging together, again, his own separation anxieties with his immigrant parents, his feelings as a gay man during the AIDS crisis, um, and uh, kind of making those different parts of himself speak to each other while also making a, a really strong political statement. And so that was a, cover, a New Yorker cover that you can Google, and it, um, it's pretty easy to find. There's also a, um, a comic strip he did with Art Spiegelman, who did Mouse, uh, right, the comics artist which um, deals with the terror of childhood more broadly. So they're talking about whether or not their work is appropriate for children in the strip. And uh, you know, Spiegelman is saying, yeah, I think it's child abuse when people give mouse to children, um, which is interesting in light of what's happening now with mouse. But I think he, I think he meant children of a certain age, right? Maybe um, young elementary school children. Um, whereas Sendak says, no, children are the most barbaric and the most um, the most inspired. Uh, they're the best readers, they're the best audience for this kind of uh, graphic work that's essentially Brothers Grimm material. It's about survival. It's about how you both hate and love your family at the same time. It's about 
uh, how you want to kill, some part of you wants to kill, some unconscious part of you wants to kill what you love the most, and hate and love are two sides of the same equation, um, and also just the raw need to survive, right? Um, and so there's a lot of kind of Bettelheim and psychoanalytic, uh, I think, uh, tropes in Sendak's work that um, he's, he's defending as, as important for children, that children already have these feelings, and, I, and I'm, I'm letting them experience it in my work more directly. So there's this kind of debate about what childhood actually means and whether it's a time of innocence. And so that was a strip that was published also around the time of, um, I think it actually might have been the same issue as his cover, but if not, it was just a year or two um, of that the early 90s. Um, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so somewhat of a New Yorker presence. At least those are the two examples that uh, I know about for sure. Yeah. Oh, we have other questions. Do we have questions? Or no? Ooh, who has a question? Oh, Julia. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. And then Julia. Oh, Just talking to us. Yeah, I was uh, thinking about uh, the discussion of like the child figure, angelic child figures, uh, and how it's approached by queer theorists, like such as like Edelman and like No Future and etc. So uh, I see a difference between that kind of conceptualization of like uh, the child and like your way of like seeing uh, the queer child and etc. So I would appreciate if you can like talk a little bit about like. Uh, that realm in your work. Definitely, yeah, great question, thank you. So, um, right, so Lee Edelman's work, No Future, which deals with how, uh, it's when I was talking about the generic child and how one uh, component of the generic child is the ways in which um, a, this particular symbol of childhood or the children sometimes gets used as a kind of political weapon um, to, for, toward protecting certain groups or interests uh, against others. Um, and Edelman argues that the, um, I think specifically the gay man, but one could say, and he might say also queer people in general, are um, demonized as a kind of vampiric presence in society that lives for its own pleasure because they don't have children, because they don't, they don't care about ch um, children's well-being or innocence, right? Um, and so Edelman is responding to that argument by, say, by saying, um, let's embrace the... Uh, the kind of joy in that um, in that description and the child the childlessness I might be kind of um, you know butchering it a little bit but the 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 he uses a particular word that I'm forgetting I think it's a French word um, to uh, describe the sort of joy that he thinks that queer people should embrace in their in their potential childlessness or existence outside of that traditional family structure and the pleasure that's involved in that kind of a lifestyle that can be val validated that kind of a life or embodiment. Um, I'm looking at how the child, so right, Sendak and his relationship to children, childhood. Um, so on the one hand, how he's challenging that ideal of childhood innocence, uh, but also how he's really speaking toward um, queer, the queer child that exists in queer adults, right? So how um, there's this kind of unrecognized, again, to use Catherine von Stockton's idea, uh, this, this sort of ghostly retrospect that always happens of, of uh, or that often happens for queer people um, who are not really allowed to embody their queerness in their youth, in their childhood. And so for Sendak, as a professional bookmaker, artist, right, creative more broadly, he is concerned with letting his child the way, the way that child was um, kind of continue to live on this larger, higher platform that speaks to the world through his art, um, right, speaking to some extent from his adult's uh, capacity, uh, his, his work ethic, his, his knowledge about the world, etc., his intuition, but also um, the playful joy the, the, and terror that uh, uh, connected to what it meant to be a queer child in the world for him. Um, so I think that uh, maybe that's a, a slightly different uh, way of thinking than Edelman in the sense that it's, it's, it's about, um, it, it's drawing attention to the kind of inherent pleasure and terror of, of being a child, and maybe especially of being a queer child, one who exists off the map socially to some extent, um, who, who is not provided a, a mirror or a sense of self, um, especially if we're looking at the 20th century, um, early mid 20th century. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but um, some thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, Anna, did you have a question or not? Uh, I was going to ask you. Oh, please. Oh, There's a question over there. <laughs> so I'll get to ask you more questions, but um, I'm wondering um, if you can say a little bit about, um, maybe obvious question for me, about 
uh, conducts relationships to the, the left uh, politically. Um, we did reference that one thing from the 90s, and I know his, um, I think his first gig was illustrating something by his teacher, Hyde Ruthless, who was, um, I'm pretty sure, um, communist. Um, so I, I, and Ms. Krauss was also part of that milieu, and I just, um, I imagine him sort of on the edges of that, but I wonder if you just have any, have any more to say about it. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, and great to see you. I, I wasn't sure if that was you, but I, I love your work also. Um, so, right, so I'm back on the left. So, um, so some, some bits I can share. So Tony Kushner's book about Sendak describes it's the art of Maurice Sendak kind of from the 80s to early 2000s. Is, is he's covering Sendak's involvement in theater for the most part. He talks about um, Philip's bedtime story, Sendak's father's bedtime stories as um, kind of the uh, socialist primers is the way he describes them, that these are stories about how uh, how dog-eat-dog -dog the, the capitalist world is and how um, the small have to band together to survive and how that, so this is often a theme that we have in Sendak's work of, especially if we look at that one of those last examples of Brundabar, um, where you know these two blonde-haired Christian children living during the Holocaust, um, not in the ghetto, outside of the ghetto, but their mother's dying and they, they need help um, and they need to make some money to buy her medicine or milk. And um, so in order to do so, ultimately they have to band together with these, um, you know, this group of children that includes a lot of Jews branded with yellow stars, right? So there's this kind of um, leftist approach of, uh, you know, and they're banding against this bully, this um, Brundabar figure who is kind of an amalgamation of, he was first drawn as Hitler and then um, Sendak scrapped that idea, it was too bombastic. Um, and instead draws him kind of like a childlike Napoleon figure, um, but also this kind of tyrant, right, that the, uh, the masses need to rise up against. Um, so that's, that's one example, um, but, but also I think um, some childhood recollections. Of, so as a young person, he remembered um, having, an, I think, an aunt or a distant relative who was a, an out-out communist, and uh, he reflected on interactions with her saying this was, it was so glamorous, um, knowing a communist, I felt so glamorous. So, so he, he did flirt with um, and, and himself identify with a lot of leftist sentiments, but he was very much in the public eye and knew what was expected of him as a children's picture book artist, the way he was branded. Um, and so I think he was also somewhat careful, but also, um, you know, this not, not in ways unlike the way he was careful about um, you know, knowing that the public didn't want to accept him as a gay man writing for children because of associations that were always made or often made between gay men and children equaling pedophilia, um, right, those problematic associations. So I think, um, I think in his friendships and in his, uh, you know, if we look at some threads in his work, we can definitely see, uh, and some recollections of his, we can definitely see that, that kind of leftist identification. Um, and even when he retired, not retired, but kept working in Connecticut by the 70s, he moved out to, um, to Ridgefield, Connecticut, and bought this huge house that reminded him of the 1930s movies of uh, with these grand houses that he loved as a child. Um, he he kind of amalgamated this makeshift family in the house. Uh, these younger people who were um, either unemployed or just out of school or didn't really have much going on for them, and uh, kind of pulled them in. And they became you know, Lynn Caponera, who is the uh, head of the Sendak Foundation, was one of those young people, and her brother was also um, uh, involved first. Uh, and so we had this kind of makeshift family that he, he brought together there. Um, and eventually he would create a, a fellowship for young artists uh, right, neighboring his house and so that he could actually work with them. And uh, uh, so, so I, think, I think that also expresses some, some similar sentiments. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you about to ask a question? Anybody else? Okay, if not, many thanks again to Golan for persevering and giving us this great lecture. Thank you. Thank you all so much for bearing with all the, the hiccups. I appreciate it.